please for the presentation of colors made by the Knights of Columbus and also remain standing uh, afterwards for the singing of our national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. Present, present colors. singing of our national anthem by the Tiller Sisters. <laughs>
ask you to pause yourself in your own tradition as we hear the invocation. Dear God, we are gathered people with a committed purpose, and for this purpose we would ask your blessings. This day and this hour we pause to give thanks to our veterans who vowed to serve and protect and who unfortunately fell into the hands of our enemies. We remember our prisoners of war. Their bravery is honored because of their loyalty to their oath of office and responsibility to the citizens of these United States. We are thankful for their courage, endurance, and perseverance at the hands of our enemies. We ask that you find favor in this recognition ceremony and that it truly honors those who have given us the gift of freedom. Bless us this day as we honor our heroes who are present and those who have gone on before us to your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Evans. Um, I do want to acknowledge some of our special guests here today. Um, we do have Dan Lasco here. Uh, Dan, if you would just stand, please. Uh, Dan is representative, um, representing Congresswoman Allison Schwartz. Thank you, Dan. We also have Don Kamal, representing Senator Deniman. We're also expecting Nick Comoff to come, representing Congressman Pitts, but I haven't seen Nick. But um, what I'd like to do now is introduce two of our state legislators that we have here today. Uh, the first one is Mr. Tim Hennessy, and Tim, if you'd come up and say a few words, please. Commonwealth, along with Chris, uh, 
and also the, the House of Representatives and the Governor uh, in saying thank you uh, and expressing our appreciation for the sacrifices you made on all of our behalf uh, and on behalf of the United States of America. Thank you. State Representative Chris Ross, uh, honored to be with you today, and uh, also look forward to hearing uh, General Becton. Uh, General Becton and I share one thing. Uh, we were both born in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure whether you were at the hospital too, but I was. After that, our careers diverged. He's got a little stronger resume than I do, but uh, uh, a very impressive uh, career service in the military and then uh, afterwards as well. It is an honor for me to be with you today, and I really appreciate the opportunity that's being afforded for us to remember service and sacrifice, and certainly those that are here today that uh, suffered as prisoners of war gave even greater service and sacrifice. And uh, I really think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to remember. We don't remember often enough, and uh, as we remember, not only those that are here, but those that served with you that are no longer here. It gives us the opportunity to seriously rededicate ourselves in the service of our neighbors, of our country, to think hard about what we are doing and what we should be doing in the future to make this country stronger, greater, more free, and to help all those that we live with uh, realize all of their dreams. So thank you again for what you have done, uh, hopefully we will all go away from here with a new sense of dedication. Thank you. Thank you, Tim and Chris, very, very much. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our Medical Center Director, Mr. Gary W. Devansky. Gary. Thank you, and thank you, Andy. And, uh, I want to thank uh, Tim Hennessy and Chris Ross uh, for being here today. They've been here many times to support uh, support the VA Medical Center here in Coatesville in many different events. So thank you for taking your time. I also want to thank uh, our Chief of uh, Chaplain Service, Larry Evans, for the coup of getting General Beckton here with us. Uh, you, you can all read his uh, CV, and we're very anxious to uh, uh, hear his uh, words uh, this, after, or this morning, rather. And uh, I guess it's afternoon by a few minutes. But this is an event we very much look forward to uh, every year. And you are our honored guests, our ex-prisoners of war and your, and your family members. And we appreciate your taking the time to be here and joining us for this uh, uh, ceremony and also for the luncheon afterward over at Building 139. I know we're going to have a shuttle uh, that will take you there right after the ceremony. Of course, each year on April 9th, uh, we celebrate National Former POW Recognition Day. Uh, ours got delayed a little bit uh, for certain scheduling reasons to today, April 17th. But uh, we're here to, uh, to recognize you and to honor you, our former prisoners of war. We pay tribute to you today who survived uh, wartime captivity. Uh, more than a half a million Americans have been captured and interned as prisoners of war since the American Revolution. The largest number of American POWs came during the Civil War when an estimated 220,000 Confederate soldiers were interned by the North, and nearly 127,000 Union soldiers were taken prisoner by the South. Since World War I, more than 142,000 Americans, including nearly 100 women, have been held as POWs. And today, more than 90% of our uh, American living ex-POWs are World War II veterans, many of whom are uh, represented here in the audience today. And I want to thank, uh, personally thank, as our two legislators did as well, uh, you for all you've done for us. Uh, and I'd like right now, uh, if you're able, to stand so we can uh, give you a round of applause. If you're an ex-prisoner of war, could you please stand? Thank you. Thank you very 
very much. We're all very honored to, to have you here with us today. The hardships that you endured on behalf of your fellow countrymen have obviously kept our nation free. And for this, we're, we're truly grateful. Uh, as, prisoner, as former prisoners of war, you fought, fought fiercely and served with honor and distinction under the worst conditions. You demonstrated personal courage, selflessness, and unflagging loyalty to your country. Yours is a quiet courage based on hope and trust that saw you through a brutal and depressing military experience. And whether it lasted a few weeks for some of you or many years for some of you, during that trying time, there was no end in sight and only your personal will to go on. To lose your own freedom while fighting for the freedom of others is uh, ironic, to say the least and it has a deep emotional effect that has likely significantly impacted each of your lives. Though those who have not experienced this could never understand, today we try to make it meaningful for ordinary citizens in the audience here who are not ex-POWs uh, to help honor you today, uh, to recognize the sacrifices that you, you made. Uh, finally, I'd like to remind everyone that in a speech given in July of 1920, President Calvin Coolidge said, quote, the nation which forgets its defenders will itself be forgotten, unquote. So let us vow to never forget the courage of our nation's staunchest defenders, our former prisoners of war. Let us vow to never forget the sacrifices they made so that we can enjoy the freedoms we embrace today as Americans. So thank you once again to our former prisoners of war for your service and for your sacrifice and for taking time out of your schedules to be with us here today. I know you're going to enjoy the rest of the program, and I look forward to uh, chatting with uh, uh, some of you, or all of you, at, at lunch to find out a little bit more about your uh, experiences. It's important that, we, uh, that you share your experiences uh, with everyone you can. Thank you again.
Uh, before I introduce uh, the general, I think I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Franklin Birch, our chief of domiciliary, to come up. He has a, a special little few words to say to the group and to the general.
While in the service, Beckman graduated from Prairie View A&M College and the University of Maryland. He also graduated from the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, the Armed Forces Staff College, and the National War College. He retired from the U.S. Army in 1983 and went on to serve as director of the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance in the United States Agency for International Development from 1984 to 1985. He then served as director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency from 1985 to 1989. After this, he became an education administrator from 1989 to 1994. He was the fifth president of Prairie View A&M University, his alma mater. Next, he became superintendent of the Washington, D.C. public school system. Beckman served as a director to several corporations, academic institutions, and associations. He has been named one of the 100 most influential blacks in America by Ebony Magazine. He also received the Distinguished Service Award from the Association of the U.S. Army and the Boy Scouts of America Silver Beaver Award. His autobiography, Beckman, Autobiography of a Soldier and Public Servant, was published in 2008 by Naval Institute Press and is available for sale after the program. Beckton and his wife Louise have five grown children, 11 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. The couple resides in Northern Virginia. So please join me in welcoming General Beckton.
through former prisoners of war recognition day, noting that American prisoners of war, you, exemplify the courage and sacrifice that defines the nation's men and women in uniform. These brave warriors, you, have paid a massive share of the cost of freedom, and our nation will be forever in your debt. Today, we honor all prisoners of war by recognizing the tremendous sacrifice made and the hardships endured by those who fight for our freedom. American prisoners of war have experienced extreme conditions across the world, and many have made the ultimate sacrifice. 67 years ago, in the midst of World War II, nearly 12,000 Americans and 76,000 Filipinos were captured while defending positions in Bataan Peninsula in the Philippines. As prisoners of war, they endured the Bataan Death March, suffering starvation, torture, and unspeakable conditions. Thousands were randomly executed and many perished on this journey. During the Korean War, more than 1,600 Americans died under grave conditions at Pok Tong Camp. In Vietnam, Ho Lo Prison, the famous Hanoi Hilton, Americans endured torture and other forms of inhumane treatment. There are countless tales of the bravery of the American prisoners of war, of the burdens borne, and of acts of heroism. <laughs> These individuals have made great sacrifices and have demonstrated an enduring faith in themselves and in the United States. Their commitments call out to all Americans to live up to our nation's highest ideals and serve and to serve our, self, our fellow citizens with equal selflessness and honor. He concludes the statement, we will never forget their sacrifices, their spirit of service will inspire the American people for generations to come. That's the proclamation that the President gave on the 9th of April. In that same issue of the National Association for Uniform Services is the announcement of the creation of the Joint Lifetime Electronic Health Record, which will streamline the transfer of active duty military and veterans, health workers, between these two departments. I'm sure you've heard about that, but it requires a great deal of teamwork to make that happen. And when I read that, I thought about a letter which I had seen many years ago, which sort of describes something called teamwork. This letter was written by an author unknown, but it was sent to an insurance company. And I like to read what the letter says. Dear sir, I'm writing in response to your request for some more information concerning Block 11 of the insurance form for which was asked cause of injury wherein I put, trying to do the job alone. You said you needed more information, so I trust the following will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer by trade, and on the day of injury, I was working alone, laying brick around the top of a four-story building, when I realized that I had about 500 pounds of brick left over. Rather than carrying the brick down hand by hand, I decided to put them in a barrel and then lower them by pulley, which was fastened to the top of the building. I secured the end of the rope at the ground level. I went up to the top of the building and loaded the brick into the barrel and flung the barrel out with the brick in it. Then I went down and untied the rope, holding it securely to ensure the slow descent of the barrel. As you would note in block six of the insurance form, I weigh 125 pounds. Due to my shock at being jerked off the ground so swiftly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Between the second and third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This accounts for the bruises and lacerations on my upper body. Upon regaining my presence of mind, I held tightly to the rope and proceeded rapidly up the side of the building 
not stopping until my right hand was jammed into the bullet. This accounts for my broken thumb. Despite the pain, I retained my presence of mind and held tightly to the road. At approximately the same time, however, at the barrel, a brick hit the ground, the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of the brick, the barrel now weighed about 50 pounds. Again, I refer to block six and my weight. As you would guess, I began a rapid descent. In the vicinity of the second floor, I met the barrel coming up. This explains the injuries to my leg and lower body. Slowed only slightly, I continued my descent, landing on a pile of brick. Fortunately, my back was only sprained, and the internal injury were minimal. I am sorry to report, however, that at this point I lost my presence of mind and let go of the road. As you can imagine, the empty barrel came down on top of me. I trust this answered your concern. Please know that I am finished trying to do the job alone. Yours sincerely. Like the bricklayer, if each one of us and each one of our agencies in Washington went off to do the job alone, we are all risking the same calamitous result. Success comes from working as a team. And I'm delighted to know that now DOD and the VA are working as a team. And <laughs> Is a personal friend, and I can assure you that what may have happened in the past will not happen again. In 2000, the U.S. Congress created the Veterans History Project as part of the Library of Congress American Folklight Folk Life Center. Its mission is to collect, preserve, and make accessible the personal accounts of American War veterans so that future generations may hear directly from veterans and better understand the realities of war. How many of you have signed up for that program, Veterans History Project, and made an oral statement? Aha. Uh -huh. Sir, I can assure you they'll be out there to take your people information. Another effort is the World War II Memorial, located between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial and was designed to tell the stories and pay homage to the, our greatest generation. In this respect, how many of you have seen that memorial? Ah, good. I'm honored to acknowledge the fact that I have been involved with both of these memorials. Library of Congress Veterans History Project is headed up by Colonel Bob Patrick, a friend, and he used to work for me. The World War II Memorial, was built by the American Battle Monument Commission and headed up by P.X. Kelly, a Marine, and other friend. Currently, we have over 60,000 oral histories in, recorded in the project, American, the Veterans History Project. And with respect to the World War II Memorial, early on, we, the American Battle Monument Commission, were taken to court because there were people opposed to having the memorial put at that location between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument. The answer was they, they said that we are spoiling the vista between these two memorials. My response and our response to them, if it weren't for this generation, we could be speaking German. <laughs> By the way, that World War II Memorial is lowered nine feet below the level and it does not block anything. Another challenge concerning the World War II Memorial is the hopes that we fail to include President Roosevelt's praise, so help us God, which is true. It is not included because Roosevelt did not use that phrase with the recorded statement that we have on display. And I'm gonna read that statement, what we have. If you've seen it, you saw it said, Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, a date which will live, live in infamy. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people 
in their righteous might will win through to vic absolute victory. At no time did President Roosevelt use the term, so help us God, when he made that statement. Just last week, I received an invitation from the least, lest we forget our best eight, an organization, veteran-based 501c3 corporation, whose mission is to organize, host, and otherwise produce veterans-related events to honor and preserve memories of veterans of the armed services from all conflicts and branches of service, as well as to attend other veterans' events with the purpose of educating the public with displays and veterans-related items. You might ask, what benefit is that to the veterans? The answer is very simple. It is our hope that through this symposium, a veteran will gain new insight into their qualifications for medical benefits, burial rights, and other veterans assistant programs. Again, I remind you of that bricklayer working together. And as I continue my discovery in preparing to come here on the subject of prisons of war, I discovered that we have a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense who is charged with developing the personal accounting community's strategy for 2009. Its mission is to establish the most favorable conditions and conduct operations to account for those missing in past conflict and prepare to account for those who remain missing following current and future conflict. The stated vision of this organization, the fullest possible accounting of those who become missions, missing due to hostile action while pursuing U.S. national objectives abroad. Finally, the message I take from all of this is a need for greater transparency for the public particularly for you, the veterans, to better understand the situation, to better understand the challenges that are with the folks in Washington, as well as to, as to those things that our government is doing. Now, my $64,000 question, $64, question to you, very simple, the form of POWs, with respect to all the programs I've mentioned, how well are we doing? Now, I don't have any magic potent I do have a few contacts in DOD and VA. No one or two people in the office of the president. So again, I say, how well are we doing? If you have something which you think that is not getting through, I'll be more than happy to respond to your email. And my email address is very simple. General B at AWO.com. Chaplain Evans, many thanks for making the call. Gary Devesky. Thank you so much for the invitation to coming here. And for you, the POW, the former POWs, my heart goes out. I know how, I don't know how you feel because I've never been there. I came close in Korea. But I think I know. I want to say again, good luck and God bless. up here uh, in the front. If any uh, veterans would like to get involved in that, we encourage you to get involved. We've had other uh, veterans uh, participate in the Veterans History Project, and Andy has facilitated that right here at Coatesville, and we highly encourage you to do that. And I'd also echo, you know, we try to do our best at each and every day for all veterans here, uh, especially our XPOWs, and if you have suggestions or issues, you can contact any one of any one of us, any one of our staff, including me, please feel free to come up and see me at any time. Um, we always have an open door. Uh, I'd also uh, encourage, as the general did, any World War II veteran who has not yet seen the World War II Memorial in Washington to see it, uh, to try to take the time to see that beautiful monument to the greatest generation. I was fortunate enough to be there on the day it was dedicated and to attend the memorial service at the Washington Cathedral uh, that morning. And uh, it, was a, it was a great event that was a long time coming and the commission worked very hard uh, to make sure it, it got in the right place on our national mall. 
So uh, like the general uh, mentioned, I'd encourage uh, you to see that if you haven't seen it. Uh, as a small token of our appreciation to the general, I'd like to present him with the certificate of pride and public service uh, presented to the general. I won't read it, but it's in recognition of his uh, time, uh, his service to our nation, and for being here, taking time out of his very busy schedule to travel here from Northern Virginia uh, to be here at Coatesville today. Uh, so in addition to thanking and honoring all our uh, POWs, uh, we thank the general for his long and very distinguished career in service to the United States of America. Thank you very much. Uh, the general's definitely a hard act to follow. Uh, as the director said, Mr. Devansky and, and the general, about the uh, Veterans History Project. Um, I do want to put a plug in for that, that we should give a lot of consideration, especially our World War II veterans and our POWs here today. Um, as the General said and Mr. Devansky, we have done around 10 or 15 of these videotapings here. And um, this actually goes into the Library of Congress. And we give a copy of the videotape or the DVD to the veterans and their family members. So this is something I'd like you to consider strongly. And if you are interested, then please get in touch with me. All right, um, I think it's my pleasure to announce the Tiller Sisters again. You gonna do a little song for us?
Thank you. Uh, again, uh, on behalf of our medical center, I do want to thank all of you for coming today. Uh, we have a great luncheon over in building 139, our main kitchen, kitchen and we do have a shuttle service uh, that we'll be leaving from right out front. So 
again, uh, thank you for coming.